You're welcome, everyone. I'm Markus Hallensleben. I'm associate professor in the Department of Central East and Northern European Studies and steering committee member of UBC's Center of Migration Studies. You can find more information about the center at migration.ubc.ca or under the hashtags you see here on the screen. This event is sponsored by two of the center's research groups, the one on mobilities and the one on narratives. And I'd like to thank my colleagues Gao Sang for co-organizing, Sophia Ramos for the administration and advertising parts, as well as Emily Amburgesi for the technical support. Today's talk by Dr. Roger Bromley on less than human, examining the representation of refugees through the lens of decoloniality is also part of my undergraduate course on exile, flight, and migration. And since we have already discussed some of the issues that deal with displacement and decolonization in the course, I'd like to share just one student's response when asking, when I asked them to write a land acknowledgement and to position themselves when living and studying on the, or by living and studying on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Hamasquam, Squamish, and Slaver Tooth people. And uh, let me uh, read what, um, one second, please. Let me read what uh, Maira Hossein wrote. Having grown up in BC, I was not aware of the concepts of colonization until learning about the inhuman events that happen in the residential schools to indigenous children and their families. I think it's vital to continue raising awareness and being respectful of the land. We should all be grateful to live in. It was quite revealing how to this day, indigenous rights are still not being respected by the Canadian government and law authorities. Having never experienced the frustrations of the indigenous people, I consider myself in a place of privilege to be able to live in what was originally the land. And I continue to learn about the injustices which occurred and hope to find new ways to support the protection of indigenous land and indigenous rights. Thank you, Maya, for sharing. I myself, as a settler, privileged immigrant and uninvited guest to these lands, am also aware that without the generosity and curiosity of the Musqueam people, as well as with their tradition of sharing knowledge, we would not be able to host this event at UBC today. It's my pleasure to briefly introduce now Roger Brumley, our speaker, who I had the chance to personally meet at a conference on post-migration in Odense at the University of Southern Denmark in 2018. He's Emeritus Professor in Cultural Studies at the University of Nottingham and was a visiting professor at Lancaster University until 2017. He has taught in a range of universities in the US and the UK. He has widely published on post-colonial culture and diaspora, refugee and asylum issues, and particularly in relation to cinematic representations and also on post-conflict cultures. His main book publications are on, and I just name a few, Lost Narratives, Popular Fictions and Politics that came out in 1988, on narratives of new belonging, diasporic cultural fictions from 2000, and from Alice to Buena Vista, Alice to Buena Vista, the cinema of Wim Wenders, which came out in 2001. In his lecture today, which we pre-recorded yesterday, he will be talking about, or from his first opening chapter, coming out of his most recent just published book that came out with Palgraf Macmillan. And it is on narratives of forced mobility and displacement in contemporary literature and culture. He will outline the main theoretical arguments of this book and then conclude with a section drawn from chapter three 
that covers and that's a sub uh, chapter title policing displacement and asylum giving voice to refugees after his 45 about 40 to 45 minute long lecture which again will be shown as recorded yesterday he will be with us and he is with us already in person to answer your questions which we kindly ask you to enter in the chat section so please enjoy his talk I think you need to be unmuted to hear your audio. Uh, I'm sorry, everyone. Okay, let me just back up. Good morning. Is that okay now? Um, I'm speaking to you from Edinburgh in Scotland. Yes, we can hear it. The morning Great. was several hours ago, but uh, good to see you anyhow. Can I just start by thanking Marcus and Zhao Hung for inviting me to give this talk? and also to thank Emily for facilitating this uh, particular Zoom recording. Uh, I'd like to start the presentation with a headline, which I hope you can see, from the Times newspaper two years ago. Uh, it, it, in some ways, it summarizes everything I want to say this, afternoon, this morning. Uh, sunbather nearly hit by falling body is Oxford graduate. Now, the story is about a stowaway falling from the wheel chamber of landing gear as it was, was lowered prior to landing. Why the Oxford graduate is mentioned, I have no idea. It's completely irrelevant. But look at the syntax. Sunbather nearly hit by falling body is Oxford graduate. The Oxford graduate, a young man in his 20s, a software engineer, sitting in the garden of his $4 million home in West London, and a man falls from the sky into his garden. The interesting thing is the Oxford graduate is given a subject, an identity, He's personalized, he's specific. The falling body is anonymous. It's objective, generalized, and absolutely no specificity. A man who falls from a Kenya Airways flight from Nairobi to London. So this summarizes, as I said, what I'm going to say. We have the white, privileged European who's named in the article, actually. And he's given his Oxford belonging, which shows his certain elitism. But above all, it's the white male European who is the subject of the story, not the othered non-white falling body. So this, as I said, ties in very much with what I want to say the rest of this morning. I used to start my classes with students some years ago by asking, what does a refugee look like? Um, a stupid question, a way, an impossible question to answer. We don't know, but the point I was making is that we generalize about refugees. Uh, we think of them in terms of mass, of drowning in the Mediterranean, on overloaded boats, um, crowded on overloaded lorries in the desert. We rarely close up, do a close up or give any perspective. 
So in the book, which um, I've just recently published, what I've been trying to do was locate the ideological underpinnings of current and previous European attitudes towards ref refugees, encapsulated in the concept of racialization as the primary logic of global capitalism. I'll repeat that several times throughout the talk. The codification of racial differences began with the Spanish and Portuguese conquest, which produced a matrix of power that still exists. The point is it centers the white European and usually male, and it excludes. So exclusion is a key category of treating the non-Western person. In the course of the book, I also try to find counter narratives, other forms of representation, which would subvert or at least question negative populist representations of refugees as dangerous invaders. So the logics of excludability not only result in dehumanization from long standing modes of thinking, what Foucault calls the long baking process of history, excludes people from modes of thinking about the world and the various people in it in colonial, modern, hierarchical terms. So dehumanization is a way of thinking about others. If I want to harm somebody, first of all, I have to make them into an enemy. I have to dehumanize them, render them impure, impure dirty, inferior, criminal maybe, rapist, potential terrorist, carrier of diseases. And I'm summarizing in, that, in those few words, um, a dominant way of thinking about particularly the young male refugee. What we've got there is stereotype. Forms of speech to convey that some people are less than human compared with me. I, I mean me in terms of a white European male. So we've got stereotypes, we've got devaluation. And one of the themes running through this talk is the question of value. And in order to situate these ideological attitudes at both elite and popular levels, it's commonly said, oh, of course, this is a working class, these working class attitudes. They're not. They run through the classes, and I would argue they run from the top downwards. Those who were once part of the colonial elite and their heirs today. So why are we able to dehumanize people, to argue that they are people out of place? And that out of place is quite a, is, is a, an important category to think about. So I've been looking at the effects of displacement as seen in narratives, cinematic narratives, literary, memoir, produced by, with, or about refugees and migrants, particularly produced by and with refugees. So the work is a task of reclamation trying to contribute to a redirection of the current stream of anti-refugee re 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 rhetoric, or at the very least, opening up new dialogues about refugees. In the, popular, in the popular media, and it's very hard to distinguish in the UK now between popular and so-called um, better newspapers, in popular media, distinctions between asylum seekers, EU migrants, and irregular economic migrants are conflated for hostile purposes. So sometimes I'll use the term migrant as a generalization to refer to all those categories of people. Now, as you know, in 2015, <clears throat> there was a so-called refugee crisis in Europe. Uh, in fact, it was more of a crisis of Europe because most of the refugees in the world don't come to the West 
either North America or, or Europe. They remain in countries adjacent to their countries of origin. This is for obvious financial and logistical reasons. So thinking about the crisis of Europe, it needs to be seen in its wider context of decolonial thinking. Now you're probably quite familiar with decolonial thinking in Canada, but it's not so common in the UK, ironically, as, as the source of one of the most powerful and vicious empires. So I also want to think about what is called the coloniality of power. Now, colonialism has ended in most cases, but coloniality is something which continues to this, to this day. And I'll, I'll explain that a little later. One very important article I read, which set me thinking in, along these lines, was an article by Sylvia Winter, which I've cited on my handout, in which she calls the Western bourgeois conception of the human man, which overrepresents itself as if it were the human itself. I repeat that because it's very important. The bourgeois conception of the human man, it is man, which overrepresents over itself as if it were the human itself. And this overrepresentation means that refugees are seen as disposable, regarded as less than human. And once the idea of dehumanization takes hold, it's accompanied by impunity and indifference. So if 40,000 people have been lost in the last 30 years in seeking to reach Europe. It's a matter of indifference. So what? Just another statistic till we turn the page and read on. But what this over-representation over also means is that Europeans, Westerners, have arrogated to themselves the power to classify and categorize from a colonial point of view, forms of representation of what they call other. So this classification, this presumption to order, arrange, and nominate people as other than man. It's the, it seemed like an objective point of view, dispassionate, but in fact, of course, it's not highly um, passionate and biased. So we can sign those we marginalize, those in the global south, we can sign them to a symbolic death. So, as I said, nearly 40,000 people have been killed, have lost in the last 30 years. And we see migrants massed at borders, being excluded. We see them in overloaded boats, drowning sometimes at sea, with images of discarded life jackets, always en masse, generalized. And of course, we've also seen in recent times, the proliferation of walls in the contemporary world, walls, fences, borders, which has given rise to a reactionary nationalist populism in Europe, in the USA, and probably in Canada, I don't know. All of this acts in support of global neoliberal technologies of government. So any attempt to unsettle what I've been talking about, this over-representation, necessitate, necessitates, necessitates an understanding of what a number of Latin American theorists, people like Chiano, Mignolo, have called the coloniality of power. And I'll be using this term throughout to refer to the system that organized the distribution of epistemic, moral, and aesthetic resource, resources in a way that both reflects and reproduces empire. <clears throat> 
and as a way of naming that set of framing and organizing assumptions that justify hierarchies and make it almost impossible to evaluate alternative claims. So decoloniality is a project designed to deconstruct colonial logics and narratives and to challenge the idea of modernity being something which is peculiar to and appropriated by the West. Time, space, memory have all been colonized, not just by colonialism, by, as I said earlier, a coloniality, which in Gross Fogel's terms, allow us to understand the continuity of colonial forms of domination after the end of colonial administrations, produced by colonial cultures and structures in the modern colonial and capitalist world system. So why and how do we distance ourselves from refugees? And what set of values enable us to do so? One part of the answer, as I said earlier, is racialization. One of the primary legacies of colonialism. With the idea of race, <clears throat> the most efficient instrument of social domination invented in the last 500 years. This is what Walter Melonio has said. So racialization produced the classification and categorization of people in a hierarch hierarchical terms, with the white European at the apex of this hierarchy, the bearer of rationality, order, logic, and the non-whites in spaces of otherness as irrational, backwards, inferior. Now, glo global inequality is one of the root premises and also effects of this racialization and a reason why degradation, immiseration, and the violent deaths of refugees are met with such indifference. They are, in Judith Butler's words, the ungrievable, lives regarded as disposable. They're so stripped of value that when they're imperiled, injured, or lost, their potential loss is no occasion to mourn. Whose life is a life, Butler asks. And whose life is effectively transformed into an instrument, a target, or a number, or is effaced with only a trace remaining or none at all, like the falling body in that newspaper headline, if erased effectively. So if we systematically represent figures of lack, refugees as figures of lack, without worth or value, those whose lives are not worth living. This derives from long-standing ideas about racial difference. And this was not invented by the Nazis, although they did use this phrase about Jews and others, lives not worthy of living, seen as subhuman. So immigration control, big issue in the UK after Brexit, immigration control, racism and exclusion are inseparable. So as an imperializing force, Western Europe not only practiced slavery and extensive forms of exclusion and dispossession, but also developed an accompanying ideological narrative. This distorting vision of coloniality, which persists today. Without that narrative, and it's a European Western narrative, which dominates ways of thinking. I grew up in the 1950s and my schooling was saturated with images of empire, narratives of empire, ideologies, I didn't know they were ideologies, ideologies at that age, ideologies of empire. As Mignolo argues, the ethno-racial foundation of modernity was established by Christianity's victory over the Moors and the Jews in 1492, the colonization of the American Indians, and the establishment of slavery in the New World. Another 
you know, say, decol decolonial thinker, an African this time, Ashio Mabembe, says, when it comes to imagining the inhumanity of foreign peoples, race has been the ever-present shadow in Western thought and practice. It's the epistemic base of colonial power. So race is a key factor in the distribution of power in society. And this relates to something else that Mbembe said. The colonial person is a living, talking, conscious, active individual whose identity arises from a three-pronged movement of violation, erasure, and self-writing. That, that word erasure is important. The West attempted and succeeded in most cases in wiping out and erasing the non-European as anything other than one-dimensional. So, decoloniality means that challenging the idea that colonized spaces of otherness are inhabited by primitives. This definition of decoloniality starts from identifying what they call, the theorists call, the colonial matrix of power and its universals of Western modernity and global capitalism. And in challenging this Western hegemony, it's important to delink, key word in decoloniality, delinking from hegemonic Western narratives by means of what they call epistemic disobedience, rupture. I'll talk about that a little later. So decolonial, decoloniality means a transformation of the rigidity of epistemic and territorial frontiers established and controlled by the coloniality of power. So all I'm talking about today is relations of power. Power which, as I said, presumes to name, govern, and classify. You think about Africa, the 19th century, height of the British Empire, so many names of places, rivers, mountains, towns were drawn from Victorian names of places, towns, etc. And in the act of decolonizing, we think of a country like Zimbabwe, which was until 1979, Rhodesia, named after Cecil Rhodes, and it became Zimbabwe. Its principal city was Salisbury. That was renamed as Harare. And there are thousands of examples of, of a remapping, a renomination of places seized from the colonial power. Why in a country like Britain, USA, is there so much fear and loathing of refugees? I'm generalizing, of course, there are many people who welcome refugees, support refugees, and help them, help them to actually um, become subjects. If you think about Franz Fanon, his phrase, the wretched of the earth, we think automatically of those outside the West. But in fact, in Western European, North American countries, neoliberalism, austerity and growing inequality means that this term also now resonates within the West. People are feeling disempowered, dis displaced, hence the growth of populism and the far right in, in Europe, United Kingdom, not so much United Kingdom, very strong in countries in Europe and the USA, of course, with this fear of invasion. The idea in the far right, particularly, that natives, so-called, they mean white Europeans, are being replaced by people from Africa, from Muslims in particular, 
hence the Islamophobia so rife in Europe and the UK, frankly. And The Great Replacement was the title of a book written about 10 years or so ago, uh, in which it argues that there's a reconquest of Europe taking place. If you actually look at the figures, at the moment, in Europe, 4% of the populations are actually Muslim. And in another eight or nine years' time, it's calculated that 7% of Europeans will be Muslim. Hardly sounds like a replacement. Do you remember the 2017 Unite the Right Charlottesville <coughs> riots, actually, in Virginia? What were they shouting? You will not replace us. And also, if you listen carefully, Jews will not replace us. So anti-Semitism is still rife. And it's part of this. The marginalization of Jews goes back hundreds of years. So in, in some senses, the idea of an invasion leads to borders, as I said, fences, walls, Refugees symbolize precariousness, a borderline existence, which unsettles and gives an unwelcome reminder to many people in the West, in the privileged West, who are now almost also potentially remaindered. So refugees occupy the borderland between abandonment and value, which is now actually shared by many. All you have, some people say, is your sense of belonging as the primary indicator of your value. Maybe your whiteness, your maleness is all you have. Hence the phrase white genocide used a lot in the States to describe this so-called replacement. So this accounts for the hostility towards those who are perceived as impacting upon your belonging taking my jobs, my houses, my benefits, etc. And this works, this hostility, through repeated xenophobia and stereotyping. Essentialism, which is another key concept in representational discourses. Refugees, as I said earlier, criminals, rapists, dirty, violent and scroungers. In order to resist seeing the refugee as a knowing subject with autonomy and agencies, many Europeans essentialized the other, reduced to a set of invariable and negative characteristics as racialized subjects. And this enables us to regard their deaths, as I said, with indifference, through a process of emotional disident disidentification. Apart from the theoretical concepts which I've outlined briefly and connected to them, it's also necessary to consider a range of issues related to the representation of refugees in often reductive Western discourses, such as the sentimentalized passive victim, the object of compassion, usually poor, pitiful women and children. They're given no story at all often reduced to a shadow that occasionally flits across European vision. So we need all the, other, the opposite of pity, of course, is seeing the refugee as a threat. And we need to replace these discourses, these images, with the idea of the refugee as a subject with agency, author of their own narratives, individualized, specified, resistant actors in their own lives and possibly in time newly emergent citizens. So how we render the refugee knowable is another challenge, a challenge to the politics of representation. Where there is humanitarian concern, it's always seen from the outside. Um, tends to focus on vulnerability. Of course, the vulnerable must be protected. 
but to see all refugees as victims or vulnerable people is a perspective that needs to be critically examined for its reductiveness and refusal of agency. And this involves a number of political, theoretical and methodological challenges. In some ways, the experience of refugees is unrepresentable from the outside anyhow. It is an unimaginable existence, unrepresentable in a sense. And whatever representation forms are always inadequate. So if we acknowledge the limits of representation, this necessitates the development of other lenses for perception, a new sensitivity, a search for new and radical rhetorical forms. Hence, so many of the films, books, which I look at in the course of my book, are using radical forms and pay great attention to the form. It's not just the subject, the story, but the form of representation is crucial. Representations which unsettle and disrupt expectations and preconceptions about the refugee. The refugee is this or that or the other. But from their own perspective, it's quite different. So unsettling this power, the power of the West to name, from the, spe from the perspective of the refugee, means, as I said, the forms are important. So the central point of radical narratives, I'll briefly discuss at the end, is an intervention in not the refugee crisis, per se, but the crisis of representation of negativity. In Silencing the Past, Michel Rolf Tour, in exploring the Haitian Revolution, speaks of the lack of conceptual frames of reference for understanding or even acknowledging the revolution. In terms of Western thought, the event was unthinkable. The unthinkable is that which one cannot conceive within the range of possible alternatives, that which perverts all answers because it defies the terms under which the questions were phrased. So the questions are as important as answers. And what Truyo was suggesting is that we lack an enabling vocabulary. And one of the tasks of challenging anti-refugee rhetoric is to develop an enabling vocabulary. So by exploring the limitations of sympathy, the shortcomings of the liberal claim of common humanity, and insisting on the ethical dimensions of representation, my book seeks to discover new frames of reverence at the theoretical level, and new interventions in literary and cultural form, a range of possible alternatives. And I mention in the book, a film called Those Who Jump, which filmed refugees on the European-African border from the perspective of a refugee himself. A film called On the Bride Side, which is a collaboration between refugees and citizens in Italy to enable people to secure asylum. And Beirut's Bukhani, no friend but the mountains, which I'll comment on towards the end. So we need to find alternatives, as I said, which subvert the presumption of knowing the refugee. In Ed Edward Said's famous Orientalism, he talks about, at the end, about knowing the native. The native was a term used always by Westerners describe those other than themselves and people who are presumed to have no knowledge. And in some senses, it was the task of Western Europeans to know the native. And of course they use the stereotypes which we are now all familiar with. 
I want to talk briefly about the term Global South. This is argued something which is construct, a construct of Western knowledge. The colonial zone is par excellence, the realm of incomprehensible beliefs and behavior that in no way can be considered, considered knowledge, whether true or false. The other side of the line, those outside the West, harbor only incomprehensible, magical, or idolatrous practices. The utter strangeness of such practices led to denying the very human natures of the agents of such practices. As Truil noted, unmarked humanity is white. Now I grew up and was schooled in the 1950s. And as I said, every moment was in some senses imperialized. We had cartoons of cannibals, of voodoo, of these strange creatures who were less than human, not like us. I didn't know until probably the 60s, early 70s, that I was white, that I was male, that I was heterosexual and middle class. I don't mean that literally. What I mean is that we didn't have the enabling vocabulary Cultural studies, which is the field I work in, in its early moments in the 60s, early 70s, spoke primarily of class. Race, gender, sexuality came a lot later. Hence, I would describe myself to students in the 70s in those terms I've just mentioned. Unmarked humanity is white. White is not an ethnicity. Truyo goes on to say, the invention of the Americas, the simultaneous invention of empire, the division of the Mediterranean by an imaginary line going from the south of Cadiz to the north of Constantinople, the westernization of Christianity and the invention of a Greco-Roman past to Western Europe. These are what, these are the terms of these processes by which Europe became the West. And by using the theoretical paradigm of border thinking, Mignolo proposes a rereading of the history of the West as modernity, its claim to modernity, arguing for a displacement of Europe and a rigorous questioning of categories which have reproduced the marginality of the histories, spaces, and subjects of the colonial frontier of modernity. So the global south, as de Souza Santos defines it, is, he says, not really a geographical concept, but a metaphor of the human suffering caused by capitalism and colonialism on the global level, as well as for the resistance to overcoming or minimizing such suffering. It's therefore an anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist, anti-patriarchal, and imperialist South, anti-imperialist South. It's a South that also exists in the geographic North, in Europe and North America as we see in the form of excluded, silenced, and marginalized populations. It goes back to the, my earlier point, that people sometimes in the West, sometimes in Britain, in the USA, and possibly Canada, all they have is kind of residual whiteness as an identifier, as a signifier of their worth. And just to emphasize this, this is a comment made by an Australian about racialized mi migrants and asylum seekers. He says the refugees fragmented, dislocated out there confirm my being as unified, placed in here. 
at the same time as they threaten by identity with their implied numbers and sheer otherness. That's interesting. The refugees seen as fragmented. Sorry about that. The refugees fragmented, dislocated out there confirm my being as a unified placed in here at the same time as they threaten my identity with their implied numbers and sheer otherness. As I said, because the imaging of refugees is so often in terms of mass, with huge numbers, and their difference is seen as sheer otherness. A myths of national belonging, and that, I just described that, are part of a defensive territorial self-fashioning and develop in relation to concepts of not belonging. That's the foreigner, the other, the stranger. The stranger we wish to exclude. The, the asylum seeker is used to consolidate the ideology of shared identity and national sovereignty. And what the cultural forms I look at do is break into these stereotypes and fragments by introducing a range of complex and contra contradictory fi figures, a mul multiplicity of voices whose presence in, but not of the national space constitute a claim or entitlement to inclusion, which goes against long-standing constructions of the alien and points up, in fact, the provisional and arbitrary nature of identity. So in this final section, I want to turn to a very different set of administrative procedures for asylum seekers and humiliating forms of reception in the forms of detention, which diminish the humanity of, of the people detained and render them as less than human. It's a spectacular example in the book, No Friend But The Mountains. Spectacular example of the ways in which the coloniality of power manifests itself as a continuation <coughs> of historic settler colonialism. The book is set in <coughs> Australia, well, actually, Papua New Guinea, which is a kind of satellite of Australia. And life for the people in the regional processing center was something the life was taken away from, was subtracted, taken away. There were several instances in the regional processing center of detained asylum seekers, of murder, suicide, self-harm, and brutalization by the guards. So the establishment of the processing center was the result of Australia's offshoring of refugees arriving by boat and this is a continuation in the present day of white Australia policies, which were in force until 1973. So No Friend with the Mountains is a decolonial text representing a decolonial way of thinking and doing. In a sense, it's the answer to a hypothetical question. Can the subaltern think? It's a claim by Bukhani to be the knower and not only the known. It's a story from below to speak, a refusal to accept the category of the other, an insistence on finding a space in the hegemonic narrative for the migrant the asylum seeker. In a sense, what Bukhani, who was an asylum seeker from a Kurdish Iranian asylum seeker, worked as a journalist. What he's doing is writing the migrant into the dominant narrative. The refugees have been able to refashion the image of themselves as the other, he says. We've reshaped the understanding of us as politically inept and have been successful in projecting an image of who we are. We now present the real face of refugees for Australia to discern. So like many other texts which I talk about in the book, it's a work of advocacy and of collaborative resistance 
a decolonial intervention. Known only by the numbers, in Bukhani's case it was MEG45, which is named after the boat he was on. He invents a whole litany of nicknames and pseudonyms, which are designed to subvert the border industrial regime of the institution. This is part of a larger refusal to be represented, to fall in with the ascriptions of those who govern. Another example of this is the reference throughout the book and all his writings to Manus Prison, which is another sign of a refusal to acknowledge the euphemism of management speech, regional processing center. It's a gesture of reclamation. Conceptually, Rikhani owns the prison. And this is a small but important shift in power. Rikhani is critical of the journalists and camera people who gather round when they are deported from Australia, from Christmas Island to Manus Prison. He says these journalists, these camera people, are simply waiting to make me a subject of their inquiry. They want to strike fear into people with the movement of my possessed corpse. And this is the example by the, by the use of Manus Island to deter other potential boat people. The bus containing the refugees is parked some distance from the plane. It could have been parked quite near, but it's deliberately parked from distance so the men can be frog marched as a display, performing their captive status, performing their otherness. It's a way of staging their debasement and degradation, and above all, their value, lack of value. Value, worth, dignity, all denied to the men by the regime. And what Bukhani is trying to reclaim and to establish is value and worth. What Bikani's work is overturning is overturning an or a given order, a defiance of the predetermination of the lies of the imprisoned, refu imprisoned refugees. He's trying to build a counter myth and counter -narr narrative. In Rancière's word, in this world, the question is always to subvert the order of time pres pres prescribed by domination to interrupt its continuities and to transform the pauses it imposes into regained freedom. So interrupt, rupture, subvert, transform. These are all what I call the properties of counter representational forms which challenge power. The book shows a capacity for thought and action, common to all. The writing Bukhani finds time and space to think and write. He enacts his sub subversion, his subversion by writing, but there are other ways. Some of the other refugees upturn the order of the regime in, in staging satirical shows, sending up the officers, sending up the regime. But for Bukhani, the writing is a form of rupture in the shell of domination, a bid to force recognition from those in power. The very act of writing itself is itself not only a, a new form of representation, but a form of heresy. I'll finish on this point. What he's doing is stealing from power and above all, attempting to reverse the colonial gaze. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Roger, for your lecture. It felt as it was live and not just a recording. You raised uh, many, many points, interesting points. Um, and also some of my students and uh, some people in the audience might not be familiar with uh, the literature, literature itself, the 